you'll be playing centre back. You'll be playing centre back. There's no way you get in that midfield. Wait. I know where you're going to play. You're going to go DC. They just cross the ball and you can get your head <laughs> on it and head the ball all day. <laughs> you're rich, so that's why we brought you on it. <laughs> Sasha Clutch question didn't know he had 120, and I'm not guarantee you that. Yeah, but 120 walking around. I, I done a little digging and I, I, I was looking at who creates the most chances. Who's got the most XG? Where would I do well? You and looked I saw, up XG for this? I, and I never do that. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to This is MLS, as we are going to get you set for match day eight. Jillian Sakovitz alongside the one and only Bradley Wright Phillips and Taylor Twelman and Moa Dew joining us today as well. Sasha Question is somewhere in Nebraska on Open Cup duty. Bradley, he's been petitioning you for weeks to get you on the squad. What's it going to take? Nothing. He's going to need a lot more than begging. I'm not <laughs> doing that. I'm, not, I'm, I'm past it. I'm not going to go and embarrass myself. <laughs> Mo Taylor, What's what would you deal? give this guy to join the team? Uh, listen, Brad still got it. Listen, maybe you don't have the legs anymore, but all you need is a couple chances. He's, I, I'm saying your finishing rate is still at least one and two. I, I saw, appreciate that's you. how highly I rate. Mo, honestly, team. I appreciate you, but if I if the chair was a little higher and you saw my gut. I heard you guys coming from me last, last <laughs> week. You weren't lying. I can't get around the pitch, mate. <laughs> it's not happening. Don't be He's got nine Shane minutes in him, though. <laughs> oh, minutes. he's got nine minutes in him. I mean, and Sasha he can find a goal in that nine minutes. I could. Sasha Question didn't know he had 120 in him. I guarantee you that. Yeah, but 120 walking around. I, 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 we're different. Me and Sasha say I'm different. If I'm out there, I'm going to be running, making runs in behind. I'm not just going to walk around. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Let's talk about the very first El Trafico of the season. Taylor Twelman, you will be on the call. The LA Galaxy taking on LAFC. Are the LA Galaxy now the most exciting team in Los Angeles? Right now, right this minute, when yes. us four are having the conversation, absolutely. Will they be at the end of the year? I think there may be a debate, and that's why I think this is all the more intriguing because of the game on Saturday night. But when you look at the three killer peas, Paintsill, Pooch, and Peck, it's hard to argue that with the eye test, the way they're balancing each other out, the way they go about their business in the final third, they've scored more goals than anyone through six games of the regular season. They're creating goals. There's a real different diversity to them now. They're going to play the way they want to play, and that's dominating the ball, keeping possession. But now they can play in transition. Now they can play off of Ricky Pooch, and Jovlich is going to be the finisher, finishing off simple plays in front of goal. I think the way they're diverse, Mo, I just like the way they go about their business, and I think they're very, very good because they're balanced in different ways than in years past under Greg Fanning. Taylor, I agree a thousand percent with you. And, you know, the part that's impressed me the most is how quickly, as you mentioned, the killer peas, how quickly Peck and Paintsill have settled, how quickly they've, they've been able to hit the ground running and integrate themselves into Greg Vanny's system. Uh, I like the fact that they're not just flair players. They're players who play with flair, who play with excitement. So that brings the crowd into it. That excites the crowd. But their end goal is is always playing with a purpose. They're trying to get to the end line, get a service in. They're trying to get a shot for themselves. They're drawing fouls to slow the game down as well. And when you talk about Greg Vanny and this new cast of personnel that he's brought in, one player who's kind of floating under the radar is Mickey Yamane, the right back, who's come in and provided a little bit of, of balance, a little bit of calmness to the side as well. I think he complements Mark Delgado and Joseph Painter on that right side really, really well. And the trio of them have felt, formed this connection that – Sometimes it takes half a season to really establish and to see it fully blossom. But I've been impressed with you, just like you, and I'm sure everyone else on this panel, with just how exciting the Galaxy have been. The question will still be, can their back line not ship as many goals? And it'll be, it'll be to see if this new center back that's come in, Amiro Garces, the Colombian, how well he can settle and how much of an improvement he can provide to that back line. You've been Mo, I'm glad you brought that up real quick, Jill, because mm -hmm. it, the one thing that stands out to me, and I find it a little ironic, is that their goalkeeper came from LAFC. They've given up more goals than any team off his of set pieces this year. We saw that against St. Louis City. They do give up chances. And so I do think there's going to be this conversation as the season evolves can LAFC catch up to that? I think they may, but right now in the moment, LA Galaxy are more exciting, but they will give up chances, and they're going to give up goals off of set pieces. And I agree with do, both of you. Do you, you see this maturing, though? Say that again, Mo. Say no, that I'm again? Just, I'm, just, I'm just asking, Have you? are you seeing, like, a maturity and a and a, a level of growth in a, from a mentality? This is for both of you guys. In a mentality standpoint from the Galaxy side as well, because that – game against Sporting Kansas City, they were being smacked around and found a way to come back, right? And then 
this last game against Seattle. I know it's Seattle. I know it's a Seattle that's lacking player that's that's not in form. But to get your first clean sheet of the season, are you guys seeing the progress from a mentality standpoint and a maturity amongst this group of players so far this season? I see a maturity. I've seen them win, like you said, in different ways. But I want to take it back to the, the excitement. LA Galaxy are, are way, by far, the most exciting team in LA. They're playing well. They've got attacking pieces. But I want to bring it to the El Trafico. How many times have we seen the Galaxy going as underdogs over the last few years? I don't care how exciting they are. They're playing in a derby this, this weekend. And when they're going in as favorites, how do they play that game? They're normally the underdog. How do you guys think that's going to go though? Because I think they've been able to come in well, they, under the radar and, and just play how they want, you know, let the game come to them. They can't now. Yeah, but that's also, Bradley, why I bring up set-piece defending. That's also why I bring up, I don't think, in my personal opinion, I'm not sure 100% that John McCarthy can be your starting goalkeeper in this league. The goals they gave up against St. Louis City, inexplicable. Greg Vanny will tell you that. Anyone on the LA Galaxy will tell you that. They can't give up those kinds of goals off of set pieces. And so now at LAFC with 32-52, I think we're going to really find out. Listen, they've survived the gauntlet of an early season schedule. That is the biggest surprise for me. But if they go out Saturday, lose 3-1 against LAFC, we're going to be on the show having a different conversation. Are they a mirage? I think they've got to have a strong performance and not lose and give up goals in the manner by which they've been giving up goals this year. Five goals off of set pieces, that is an Achilles heel, Mo, that you do not want to have when you're chasing the supporter shield, you're chasing the number one seed. They've got to clean that area up. That's why I bring it up. It's one of the things I'm going to watch Saturday night. Amen. Amen to that. But I still feel like in this matchup, all the pressure is on LAFC. Because even if, LA, even if the Galaxy were to drop this game, the frustration would come, Taylor, to your point, if they can see it off a of set pieces again, because that's just inexcusable at this point in time. You've had many moments now where you can work on that, where you can pinpoint this is an issue. How do we correct it? How do we fix it? But the pressure in this matchup is, is on LAFC because of everything that Bradley said. Coming into these Derby games, the underdog, and it doesn't matter where you are on the table, it's a Derby match. There's passion. You're, a, you're the home team in this matchup as well. And there's just been confusion from my standpoint as to who this LAFC team is. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the pressure really rely, it really lies on them. And Galaxy, obviously, they'll be looking to maintain this unbeaten streak, but they're, they're sitting pretty well, and they are the most exciting team right now in LA. Brad, you know this market better than anybody. You played for LAFC. When potentially Olivier Giroud arrives this summer, how much of this conversation changes and that his arrival makes LAFC the more exciting team regardless? A big part of it will change. I, I think Dan wanga has got too much, too much on his shoulders. Obviously, the, the man can score from all different areas of the field, left foot, right foot, but he needs someone to take the attention of the rest of the centre backs. Right now, he's playing with a target on his back for what he'd done last season and what we know he's capable of. And when you look at LAFC, I'm not seeing a team playing well. I'm seeing a team that's very one dimensional. Yeah. So I think Giroud coming in, finding those centre backs, making them focus on something else will free up Denny Bowanga and we'll start to see a bit more fluidity in the attack. El Trafico, Saturday, April 6th at 7.45 rather p.m. Eastern time right here on the MLS season pass. The other marquee matchup this weekend is FC Cincinnati taking on the New York Red Bulls. Red Bulls, three-time Supporter Shield winners, two of those with Bradley Wright Phillips. FC Cincinnati, the reigning Supporter Shield champions. Mo Adu, which team is more likely to be the Supporter Shield winners come October? Ooh. <sighs> Sorry, Brad. You I, there, I, know, I love you. You're my guy. <laughs> Brad, Brad, I love you. You're my guy. But I got to go with Cincinnati on this one. I think last year Cincinnati showed us a lot about their growth and development. They won 14 games, 14 one goal games. Seven of those were clean sheets. So some people might say that's luck. I say that's all skill. And what did they do in the offseason? They went out and they got even better defensively. They brought in Miles Robinson. They brought in DeAndre Yedlin. And this season so far, they've only conceded three goals. Two of those were off of penalties. One was off a bad back pass. I look at Cincinnati, and when you want to have success, when you want to repeat success, you need continuity and you need players who have been there and done that before. The Cincinnati side has a strong spine with Roman Salatano in goal, your defender of the year in Matt Miazga, Roboto in the midfield, and then your MVP, Lucho Acasa. If they can get that a similar second year bump from Aaron Bupenza that we saw with Denny Buwanga. This team will be dangerous yet again. I still think they need another piece in the attacking phase, but guys, I, I like Cincinnati and their ability to potentially repeat as supporter shield champions. And Mo, no offense taken. Honestly, I agree with you. 
I, I, I totally agree. I would argue Red Bull are playing the better football. But the clean sheets are what takes Cincy up the league. I would argue Red Bull are playing the better football. But what this comes down to for me, if you're going to win a shield, you need depth. And Cincy have a lot more depth than New York Red Bulls. Let's say these two teams, these two squads, stay the same throughout the season. Cincy is giving themselves a way better chance to, to be up there at the, end of the, at the end of the season. So I agree with that. I love what New York Red Bulls are doing, though, boys. And, and I'm not saying I disagree with you, but I do love the new look to this New York Red Bulls, and largely in part because they can actually play a little bit. There's not this full throttle. Once we get possession, we need six or seven seconds to go from zero to 100. They've now got a little nuance to them. They've got a little quality. I've said it on this program now three or four times, and I'm going to say it again this summer. If they get themselves a bona fide number nine, now you're looking at Van Zier and Morgan and Forsberg playing off of, off of that. I think they're young and dynamic in the back. I, I just like the New York Rebels, the way they're going about their business. I think it's a big question mark for FC Cincinnati of who Bupenza is. Now, the fact is, they don't give up a ton of goals. They've only given up three goals, if I'm not mistaken, this year. So if they're going to win the Supporter Shield, Mo, you hit the nail on the head. They're going to win it by winning games 1-0. I just think there's a different look to this New York Rebels team, and I hope it, it, it entices Red Bull Global to say, hang on a minute, maybe we go out and spend real money on a bona fide, a legitimate nine, maybe not an up and coming nine, but one on the world market that solidifies this entire program. I think it's a big surprise this year that the New York Red Bulls are even in this conversation even six weeks in, and I think and they Taylor, may have a case at the end of the year. And, and that's just how I was going to end it. The fact that Red Bulls are in this conversation, we're talking about Red Bull and the Supporters' Shield, is, is credit to what they've done in the offseason and how they started the season this year. Cross-Canadian clash between Toronto and Vancouver. Another team that's had some success, and unexpectedly so, except, Brad, you did have them as your dark horse of the year, is the Vancouver Whitecaps sitting in second place in the Western Conference. Taylor, three wins, a loss, and a draw. Is it safe to say that the Whitecaps are looking different this season? No. No, not no. at all. And I love Vancouver. I love <laughs> Vancouver. I love everything they're about. They have an identity. Uh, their identity is developed within um, So then what their is identity success tactically. for the Whitecaps? Right. Uh, I mean, listen, they, they get a whole playoff game. I think that's successful. Now, listen, the Vancouver Whitecaps fans are going to say to me, Listen, we're in the West. There's not a real dominant team in the West. We can maybe surprise people. Sure, but the way the Vancouver Whitecaps go about their business on and off the field, it's always as if there's a chip on the shoulder, their backs are against the wall, they want to surprise people. They don't want any pressure. They don't want any of that. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. They've won two Canadian championships in a row. Can they win a third? Absolutely. That's how they get into CONCACAF Champions Cup. But guys, there's not a bona fide superstar. I love Ryan Gold. I think he's one of the best players in this league that goes unnoticed. He's a second forward. He's not really an orchestrator, but they've got eight different goal scorers. There's not a bona fide superstar on this team. They go as the group takes them. I think a home playoff game, um, I think finishing top four in order to get that. I think a Canadian championship for the third year in the row. Sure, but are they contenders to win the West? I don't see it. I think LA Galaxy. I think LAFC. I can't believe I'm going to say this. I think Seattle Sounders. I'm not going to count them out just yet. I just think there's going to be three or four other teams that are going to creep in there. I think success is having the home playoff game and maybe getting themselves in the CONCACAF Champions Cup through the Canadian Championship okay. play. I think we're being prisoners of, of the past. I'm looking at the West, and like you said, it's weak. There's no teams that are, are performing at all. I can't name two other teams better than Vancouver right now. They're playing some really good football. I, I can name two Galaxy. right now. Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, I'm saying, <laughs> apart, <laughs> sorry, apart from the league leaders, obviously. I'm saying they're second in the table right now. Only Galaxy are playing better than them. Only the Galaxy. That's a fact. That's on the table. But is it sustainable for Vancouver all year? Why Phillips. not? Rally I Rally think Rally you said what's right success now, to them. I give you Contending is success. Giroux. Nope, nope, stop, stop. Contending I give you success. Olivier Giroud. <laughs> yeah. He isn't here. Potentially Carlos Vela returning. Potentially. It isn't, they're not here. You're asking me now if I think they can contend? Yes. And what is success to your question, Jill? Contending. This is Vancouver Whitecaps we're talking about. The second in the table, we can't deny that. After six, what is it, six games? Give these guys some love. 
There's wait, big wait, wait, teams, big teams. Give the man star and car some All these teams that we, we, we fall back on, oh, Portland will do it. LAFC, LAFC still haven't turned up. And I love that team. They still haven't turned up. We're, we're banking on Jerome. Wait, Jeroen. but are you saying this here. program has said Portland's going to contend in the what? Oh, hang on. What, what, what? I'm saying. Bradley, Bradley, right. Bradley, 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 Bradley. Hold on a minute. Talk. We, we, I just gave them love. I didn't say, can they contend for a home playoff game? Absolutely. But what I'm asking you right now, this minute, you taking Vancouver or you taking LAFC with Giroux and either Vela or another DP come July 15th? Who are you taking? I'm taking Vancouver because Giroud and potentially whoever you just said are hey, not Mo, here. Hey, Mo, mark it down, Mo. Mo, mark here. it down right now. Mark the date out. April what? 4th, right well, now. Good news, the down. two play in Leagues Cup on July 30th. So uh, we'll, see, <laughs> we'll see how it comes out. Wait, 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 wait. Jill, Jill, yeah? Jill, real quick, real what? quick, real quick. Brad, are you saying contend in the West? Are you saying contend... The West. For MLS. Sorry, the West. The West. You never said West. MLS Cup. Yeah, the West. Brad. I'm looking at the West. It's not strong enough. Man. Mo, I ask you this Ooh. before we leave. Who is, other than Galaxy, who is playing better than it? Who is more Minnesota's convincing? put their name up there a little bit. Who? Salt Lake's put I their say name Minnesota up there a little Lake. bit. They're in the same conversation. I'd have the same argument with them. You could argue with me about those, those teams all day. But the big teams that we normally look at in the West, they're not, they've not turned up. I'm not just going to give them the credit because we normally do. They haven't turned up. Vancouver have this season. Be honest, how much of this is because you called them your dark horse in episode? Not, not at all. I just, I like what Vancouver are trying to do and what they do weekly. I do. I can't, I, my, I'm, I go by the eye. Should we talk and about every the Every week I look at them, I see good football. I see legit goal scorers in that side, legit uh, creation. They got, they got some tools, man. Okay. I believe you. I'm getting pumped up, man. I'm gonna I know you are. We'll get this. pumped about this. Toronto FC, they're coming <laughs> off a 3-1 loss to Sporting Kansas City. Started off the year three straight shutouts. Now TFC Brad's given up five in their last two. How much are the cracks showing for John Herdman's side? Cracks showing? I think it's a little unfair. I think okay. we're doing that because of the pause. We Obviously, we saw them last season. They were, they were terrible. But it'd be a little bit disrespectful to John Herdman and what he's done this season, what, he, what he's created, the culture, a new identity. He's got the two big stars playing good football and working together. They have a Shane Long, I mean, sorry, Long and, yeah, O'Neill at the back. They've been brilliant. This is a team that is only, we're calling it cracks because they lost last game. They've lost two games. This is just injuries. They don't have Sean Johnson, MLS Cup winner, leader, US international. Richie uh, Larea is out. This is a, one of the best players going forward and back. Uh, extra creation in the final third. And then obviously Insigne not playing. So for me, the cracks are not starting to show. This is a team that is real. They've shown that earlier in the season. I think John Herman's done a very good job of getting the group together. And I think that's where Bradley is coming from on this. However, I do disagree. I do think the cracks are showing. They've got the third fewest shots in this league. Insigne is now out for six to maybe eight weeks. I think they struggle scoring goals. They need something from the nine. I get it. They've only given up five goals in six yeah. games, but those last five have come in the last two games. I think the cracks are showing. And keep in mind this. I just spoke with John Herbin. He's on the recent podcast of Offside. And very, very interesting to me with the New Zealand women's national team, the Canadian women's national team, the Canadian men's national team, he never lost back-to-back -back games until the 2022 World Cup. This game back in his hometown in Vancouver with his family there, a ton of injuries. That may be the first back to back losses he's had in a long time, just because I don't know if Toronto is dangerous, dangerous enough going the other way. They need a nine. The last regular season win for Toronto over Vancouver was August of 2020. This game kicks off 7 30 p.m. Eastern time on the MLS season pass. My guys joining us in studio now, Kaylin Carr, Matt Doyle, Inter Miami taking on the Colorado Rapids this weekend. Miami Doyle with CONCACAF Champions Cup midweek against Monterey. If you are Tata Martino, how much are you using Saturday's game against the Rapids to rotate? Uh almost completely. I think even if they didn't have the midweek game against Monterey and of course the second leg following in the middle of next week, you would circle this game on the schedule and say this is when we're going to rotate the squad. This is when we're going to get rest for the guys who are a little bit long in the tooth. So you expect to see Ryan Saylor, Yannick Bright, who was the first round super draft pick this year. Leo Campana will start up top. David Ruiz should get some minutes be it in midfield or right back. 
All of that has to happen for Inter Miami if they are going to do what they said they want to do, which is compete in every competition they're in this year. It's a no-brainer. It's the Colorado Rapids at home. You have to rotate the squad for this one. Don't disrespect the Colorado Rapids. They are fresh off of their first home win of the season, a 3-2 victory over LAFC for reference. It took the Rapids until July 9th of last season to get that first home victory, and it all comes down to this guy, Georgi Mihailovic, getting an assist and two goals in that win. Kaylin, you talked about it. You said Georgie needs to step up and be that guy. Well, he goes out and does it. How does Georgie keep this form going? Well, you can see the expectations of the signing coming in were, were large and had not been productive. Zero goals, zero assists for uh, that position. They need more from him. And I thought the response at home, getting their first win of the season, and for me, more than anything, the responsibility. We saw him on set-piece delivery in situations that we hadn't seen him in the past. We saw him late on in the moments that matter. He starts this play to earn the set piece moving forward. Then he puts it away, top corner. And then here, just getting in the box, like finding a way, scoring with your knee. Who cares what part of your body this comes off of? And for a club that's desperate for identity right now, under Chris Armas to get their first win in this manner. But more important than anything from Georgie, getting him going. Now you mentioned maybe going up against a rotated inner Miami. Can you build off that? And they're going to need more performances for Mihailovic. We actually mentioned it on the show last week. Throughout the course of the season, Georgie had only been getting about 12% of his team's touches in the final third, which is catastrophically low for a playmaker. They needed to get the ball, get him on the ball more. He had close to 20% of Colorado's final third touches in that win. It is a simple formula. Obviously, it's easier said than done sometimes, but it was a good data point for Colorado heading into this game. Another big game in the West is SKC taking on Portland. Kaylin, you recently were just on the call for Sporting Kansas City. And now Peter Vermees has a bit of a striker problem. It's a good problem to have. He's got Willie Agata and he's got Alan Polito. If you're Peter Vermees, are you playing them together? I think they want to have a look at it, no doubt about it. And that was the surprise for me. It was when I saw uh, No Polito on the trip up to Toronto, a late scratch, last minute. And with his injury history, that's always been a question mark. But it's always been different uh, between the two of them. Agata's had a hot stretch in 2022. Then 2023 was all about Polito coming back. But I think especially with no Johnny Russell right now, getting your best players on the pitch and playing around a little bit with the way these two can combine. Potentially, Polito likes to drop deep naturally that leaves space and behind Agata brings a different physical profile to stretch the field so I think they do need to experiment a little bit and with three home matches in a row it might be a good time to do it I think also too Kalen it's interesting where you look at the players with the most touches under Peter Vermees in this system right now are the two fullbacks and so if you are going to play in wide areas and you're missing the Johnny Russells for a game here or there whatever it may be I think it's interesting. I think it's a very interesting situation because the way they're creating chances, it almost suits having two front runners. I like Agata. I've liked him from the moment he set foot in Kansas City. I think Peter Vermees does. The problem is Polito, when he's at his best, he may be the most diverse number nine in this league. He can do many different things at high quality. He's just fitness is a little bit of an issue there. I think Peter's going to have to look at it. I think he will look at it. I just don't know how soon, but I think it may suit them to play both for 60, 75 minutes and to give it a real look because the way their two fullbacks get forward and have so many touches in wide areas. Yeah, and Taylor, we saw it for about 60, 70 minutes against the Galaxy, and they were up 2-0. But then, obviously, in that last 10-minute stretch when Ricky Pooch just comes alive and takes over from there, that's where the questions start to come in defensively. How does that midfield interact when you drop Polito a little bit deeper? Can they account for that? But we saw it. It looked really good against the Galaxy. They just didn't get the result in the end of it. That 3-2 loss to the Galaxy was the only time that Agata and Alan Polito have started together this season. So a small sample size so far for Peter Vermees. The opposition, Phil Neville's Portland Timbers. It was an awesome start, Taylor, to the season. Unbeaten in their first three for the Timbers, but now losers of three straight. They've given up 11 goals, right, for those office set pieces. They went out and got Cripo. They went out and got Kamal Miller. And yet, I think the two gentlemen sitting next to you would agree with me. They don't look sure themselves 
defending. I think they're weak at the fullback position defending. That includes Bravo and Mascara in those spots. Both very comfortable going forward. I'm not so sure they want to defend. The other interesting part to this is, is the Timbers fans are going to tell me, listen, we've scored 11 goals. You have. I'm not taking that away. But dive into the numbers a little bit. You've barely created expected goals, which is this is where expected goals becomes a real good indicator. It's less than seven. And why is that? You've gotten worldly goals from Evander. So is the defense the problem in the issue? Is the attack the issue? I think both are in the same conversation, which is why I answer that question. The start was a little bit of a mirage because I think there are real issues with this team defending and any time you're giving up goals off of set pieces that is his identity situation that is an individual situation can you win your battle do you know how to individually defend in the moment I think the Portland Timbers are still weak in those moments. One thing that I got to say Taylor I agree across the board with that just in terms of how the pieces fit uh Mascara is always going to push up from right back. You know that's going to happen. And then anytime Portland are on the ball and he's pushed up, that is a danger in terms of allowing a counterattack. Well, a couple of years ago, Diego Chara covered most of the entire world. The numbers so far in 2024 suggest that he maybe has lost a step in terms of his range. So you have to be a little bit more disciplined when how and when you're pushing those fullbacks up. And I have not seen that yet from Portland, that level of discipline. Because, look, Diego Char is 38 years old, man. Father time wins every single battle. I still think he is a fantastic defensive midfielder in this league. I still think he's starting caliber. But he's not super superhuman anymore. He's not going to cover no. for the right back in one minute and then the left back in the other minute so they have to have a real come to Jesus moment about that and figure out the right balance which they have not done at all yet in 2024 but Doyle let me ask you a question who are the two starting center backs yeah I mean it's Kamal Miller for sure but he hasn't looked great this year and then it's a coin flip between McGraw and Zuparic and neither of those guys have looked great either none of them are comfortable chasing in the channel none of them are comfortable running over 30, 40, 50 yards, which begs the question, and I think Phil Neville's going to look at this, why not play all three center backs together? And why not shore up that back line so you don't need to rely on Superman and Diego Chara and allow the fullbacks, now wingbacks, to push forward and always have cover in behind. McGraw can't chase, Z Zuperich can't chase, Kamal Miller can't, but all three are actually very good in a three center back system I think Phil Neville needs to look at that. I really do, because I don't think the back four can cover a game in space. Mind you, Kamal Miller and McGraw, you're giving up four goals off of set pieces. That's inexcusable as well. So there's an identity crisis right now with this team defending. Another team with a couple personnel questions, but up front could be St. Louis City. Doyle, we've seen Bradley Carnell tinker with this attack. And last year, this was a big part of their identity for St. Louis City. It was a team that could get contributions really from everybody. But we've yet to see a solid attack who should it be? Yeah, I don't know because I, I look at this team and th they have a couple of outstanding pieces in Klaus when he's healthy and Edward Leuven when he's healthy. And then the rest of the guys are more glue guys. I mean, Sam Adenaran scored a few goals like that, but he doesn't consistently create danger from uh, stretches of possession. The wingers, none of them have really distinguished themselves. They brought in two new fullbacks and they've been okay, but neither guy, neither guy has been a significant upgrade on what they had last year so how do they get their best players on the field I don't even know who their best players are it's a really tough nut to crack and Bradley Carnell I think more than last year it feels like he's got his work cut out for him they'll be going up against FC Dallas four losses one win Kalen Carr what's your panic level for Dallas Hi. Hi right now. I think there's real concern with FC Dallas. They lost at home to Vancouver Whitecaps 3-1. They have a bye week and you say, okay, let's put that behind us. We'll get back on track going against Austin. And what happens? They get completely beat in pretty much every phase of the game. Nico Estevez started the whole preseason and the beginning of the season with a three-back formation. Then they've switched to a 4-4-2. None of it has worked. It hasn't clicked. 
big question marks in his third season. It feels like they've regressed. And then now they have no midfield add on to it. Uh, insult to injury. You have no Pomacol. He's out. Iramende is out. Jesus Ferreira with the hamstring. Even when he's been on, where's his best spot? He hasn't fit with their big money signing. Peter Musa up top, who's been largely invisible, a flick on header. But not much more than that. So I have real questions about the way this Dallas team responds to this and really what's their identity because they want to play with the ball as we've seen in the past and that hasn't really worked once that midfield just gets completely annihilated. And for a team that was relying on their back line last year, so good they were in the top three defensively, they're now flipped that upside down, leaking goals and second best on everything. Yeah, they needed to go out and get another center back this offseason. They didn't do that. That's come back to bite them. They're missing Giovanni Jesus. They're starting right back that has hurt them I think badly so far this year Pomacall and Yaramendi those were the guys who this was supposed to be built around whether it was a 3-4-2-1 or the 4-3-3 that that partnership deep in central midfield was supposed to be the bedrock they're both gone Pomacall for the year Yaramendi should be back soon but with who as a partner and then two DP playmakers in Ferreira and Velasco neither of whom have been able to stay on the field and oh you have a DP number nine who needs a playmaker to create goals for him it is a perfect storm of injuries I think you're right that the panic level is high the good news is, is like nobody in the West has looked great nobody in the West is ex really running away with it so Nico Estevez has a couple weeks here to try to throw some stuff at the wall find something that sticks Shifting to the East, Nashville SC taking on the Philadelphia Union. Nashville is a team that has always prided itself on its defense. It may not score a ton of goals, but they will be defensively sound. It hasn't been that story so far this season, averaging less than giving up a goal a game last year, nearly two now this season. Taylor, Walker Zimmerman out four straight games with a knee injury. We don't know when his return will be. How much of these defensive woes comes down to no Zimmerman? Uh, a lot of it does. On the other hand, if your entire identity is bend but don't break, at some point you can only bend so far, and then eventually you are going to break. And the issue is this, is when you talk to opposing coaches going up against Nashville, they're now taking a few more risks because they're not really worried, other than Hani Mukhtar, about them going the other way. So when you're not that dynamic and you're not that threatening, in the final third and in the attack and on the counter, then other teams can take a few more risks. Col Columbus was down 2-1. I was in the building calling the game, yet they were never really threatened. They weren't really worried about it. They missed the penalty early in the second half. That could have gone 2-2. They would have ended up winning that game because there's no threat going the other way. I've been on this, uh, this program. I've been on this mountain. I'm going to stay on the mountain. <laughs> until Gary Smith finds plan B, and find some other way to get Hani Mukhtar's support in the final third, then it's going to be one of these where you say, uh-oh, I, I hope Walker Zimmerman comes back. I hope this knee surgery, he's fully healthy. I hope he has no setbacks because that bend but not break, it's just not there, guys. It's not there. I think it's alarming. I think Gary Smith knows it's alarming. He's not going to say anything publicly, but they've got to find a way to get themselves going in the attack. Otherwise, that back line is going to be under a ton of pressure the entire year. What about Philadelphia Doyle? You know, Alejandro Bedoya, 36 years old, 66 caps for the U.S. men's national team. But he wasn't always a starter last season. And now this year, one start, but a goal and an assist. If you were Jim Curtin, are you starting Bedoya this season? So last, in your year, starting 11? last year, when he was healthy, mm. he was 100% a starter. And that is the big difference from this year. I think that uh, as... Alejandro Bedoya has aged. Jim Curtin has done a good job of managing him and then managing the expectations on the rest of the team where, hey, this guy is the face of the franchise. He has been our, our uh, star DP for a long time. He has been a, our captain basically since he walked in the door. But he is not first choice anymore in be? our starting lineup. And no, he shouldn't. If you look at the way Quinn Sullivan played, if you look at the way Jack McGlynn have played, those are the guys who have taken those starting shuttler roles for, for Philadelphia. And it's understandable and then you have the luxury of bringing in a guy like Alejandro Bedoya in the waning minutes of a game who could change the game for you and help you win a game it is the ideal situation for him as he sees out his career hold on a second 
I gotta be a little bit careful here because mm -hmm. I'm starting to notice a theme. You mentioned Diego Chara asking questions about Father Time. Are we I just gotta be I'm the oldest. Are we I'm the oldest person on this panel. I can do it. All I right. I just gotta be a little careful. I'm a protected here. glass. Because I'm with you on the sense that we've seen Quinn Sullivan advance into. He's got to be on the field week in week out. He has to be there. But I think he can play at a number of different positions. And if you ask me in a big game, do I want to walk out onto the pitch and do I think Jim Curtin is going to play Alejandro Bedoya? My answer would be yes. I think he can still play a big part from the start for this team, but I think they're being smarter with his minutes. And at, instead of putting him in, even in limited minutes, I think in the league play today, uh, this year, he has a goal and two assists. So I, I still think if you move Quinn... Isn't that the argument, against, isn't that the argument for, for bringing him off the bench? In limited minutes, he has a goal and two assists. When he doesn't have to empty his tank from the first whistle, yeah. then he's able to be more yeah, effective saying, over the final match, 20 minutes. In a big match. They played Deportivo Supreme Teresa twice in Champions League. They they got out of that Champions League tie with Alejandro Bedoya on the field at the end of both games, but not at the start of both games. I think coming into the season, you're not relying on your captain to from the start. I think that is a sign that he is going to be a super sub for this team, and I think it's great for the Philadelphia Union for their chances of winning something. Philadelphia Union head to Geodis Park, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on the MLS Season Pass. Time for buying or selling Moadu. Matt Doyle's going to give you a stat, and you're going to tell us, are you buying or are you selling it? And you're rich, so that's why we brought you on it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Woo, okay. He's even laughing. What He's not intro. even denying it. He's not even denying it. <laughs> He's very generous, I got to say. Intro. that One of the nicest gifts that came through for my son was, was from the Adu family. Uh, now she's just it's trying to right? she's just trying generous. to broker for more free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he, he needs more stuff, Uncle Mo. Uh, the Columbus crew taking on DC United at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday. Uh, Doyle, what do you got on Columbus? Well, I don't think you'll need to be rich to buy this one, Mo. Uh, 29.5 <laughs> is our number. That's the number of progressive passes Columbus are allowing per 90 minutes as per uh, FB ref. Those are passes of 10 yards or more completed. That is the lowest mark in the league. They have the best defense in the league by that metric. Over the past year and a half since Wilfred Nance has arrived, we have focused more on their attack than their defense, but folks, they have become elite. You buying that, Mo? Uh, Are they elite? So so buying means I agree, correct, right? So I'm buying. <laughs> I'm spending money today, all right? <laughs> I'm spending money on the crew and Wilfred Nancy and everything that he's brought to that football club. We just did the game um, against Tigres. So it, it continues not even just in domestic play, but also in continental play. They've shown that they are a side, even with missing personnel, they understand the system, and that system allows them to be very, very stout defensively. And I agree with you, Doyle. I'm buying. I'm Show buying me. too, Mo. I'm buying. I'm with you, man, and I, I'm going to borrow some money from you to, to get it done. <laughs> 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 uh, and, but uh, the, the match you called is, is exactly the reason. And, and the name I would mention is Aiden Morris stepping forward as sort of a heat-seeking missile for anything. Ten yards or what is it? Ten yeah, 10 meters, 10 yards? Ten, yeah, we're doing yards. Okay, we're we're yards in the U.S., but okay. we'll, we'll translate to meters for our friends Perfect. in Canada for this one. But, I mean, if you give Aiden Morris that amount of time, he's going to jump the lane, and, and that's how the goal actually came from Rossi um, from that press. So I'm buying this one. D.C. D.C., the 30.8, uh, doing the same stat. D.C. allow 30.8 progressive passes completed per 90, which is actually the second best mark in the league so far this year. Uh, Troy was saying he got immediate buy-in from this group. He settled on a formation. He's also settled on a rotation of players on each line. He's been able to go down that list. It has been fun to watch. It feels like D.C. are back, and I know, like Columbus, they're creating a lot of chances, but it's their defense that's driving them there. But are you saying they can do this <laughs> against Columbus? and get it done because a lot of teams have struggled going that's true i mean we saw the red bulls go into columbus and get actually torn up but you know what i'm saying that dc is going to do it against columbus this week okay well i'm going to buy it and the reason i'm going to buy it is the one match that i saw this season that columbus i think had a little bit of trouble was minnesota united and they pressed them higher up the pitch they caused some problems with columbus having to focus on champions cup as well i think that recipe allows dc to get on top of them so i'm going to give dc i'm going to buy this one i like it well I got three kids. Uh, I work hard for my money. I can't buy everything, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not buying this one just yet. Small sample size for me. Um, so TBD, TBD for DC United. I'm not buying it just yet. 
New York City FC, Atlanta United. Kaylin Carr, you will be on the call. Start us off with New York City Matt Doyle. Yeah, our number is 515.5. That's Whoa. the number of passes that NYCFC attempt per game, which is 12th in the league. From 2016 to 2022 under first Patrick Vieira and then Domi Terrain and then Ronnie Dyla, uh, NYCFC were never lower than fifth in this number. And when we talk about this team losing their identity over the past couple of years, this is the number one stat I look at. This is a team that used the ball almost for fun on a weekly basis for more than half a decade and that obviously propelled a great attack for them but is also a defensive metric for them as well because anytime they had the ball the opponent didn't. That meant they didn't have to expend energy defending. It worked. It is no longer a part of their DNA. It has been hard to watch. I think the numbers tell the story here. NYCFC have lost their identity. Buying that Mo? I'm buying it, Doyle. I'm buying it. I agree with you. And I think the defensive side of the ball is actually the part that's convinced me even more so to buy this because that was a key catalyst to how they were able to stop teams because they were just so comfortable in possession. And then that would translate to them progressing the ball higher up the field, creating some attacking phases. This team has looked unrecognizable this past season and a lot of questions to be answered for by Nick Cushing. I'm buying it as well, um, but I, a little bit for a different reason. And I think part of the issue for me with this New York City team is they're not able to get in behind anymore. They don't have that threat, especially that number nine position. Tati Castellanos was able to stretch the field, which created more space underneath for these passes, those intricate passing patterns. That threat is no longer there, so that space is no longer there in that middle of midfield. So I think that's where the problem lies for me. I think they can get back to this, but right now they don't have the pieces. Atlanta. Atlanta, our number is plus 0 0.43. That's the goals above expected that Brad Guzan has saved per 90 minutes this year. It's one of the best marks in the league. Last year, he was at minus 0.019, uh, excuse me, minus 0.19, which was one of the worst marks in the league. I didn't think Brad Guzan was going to be a starter in MLS in 2024. Uh, he has taken that job. He has held it with both hands. He's been fantastic this year. I'm buying this big time. And we had gone back and forth on the age thing. I'm a part of it. I bet against basically Guzan thinking maybe he was past it. As Josh Cohen comes in, you think he's coming from Maccabi Haifa, Champions League, 31 years old. This is his spot was my thinking. But I think I underbet on, on Brad Guzan and Thinking about even without Steon Gregerson, the guy they brought in yep. who's supposed to replace Miles Robinson, he hasn't been healthy, but Brad Guzan has continued to be strong. So I'm giving a, a shout out to the old timers here. Keep going, Brad, and uh, love to see you. 39 years old. Mo, you buying your former national team teammate? Oh, yeah. Come on now. You don't <laughs> bet against experience. And I'm going to say last year was a blip. It was a, a blip on the radar for Brad Guzan. But I being having been a former teammate of his one thing that you will never question with him is his mentality his approach to games his dedication to his craft and his skill set it doesn't hurt that I think Atlanta United as a whole have become better defensively as well but he's a player that I will always count on and depend on in the moments to make the big saves to keep this Atlanta side in contention for winning the East potentially maybe in supporter shield a blip in a year coming off of a, of a big injury next up the Chicago Fire taking on the Houston Dynamo Doyle what do you got for the fire yeah I don't think this one is a blip it's a 62.2 percent that is the completion percentage Chicago are allowing on long balls they face that is the fourth worst mark in the league that has been a, a story for them over the past several years it has has never gotten better. It's never gotten much worse than this either. Um, I think it's two things. The center backs aren't being aggressive enough in just winning their duels. They're getting manhandled almost on a weekly basis. And then the other thing is if you look at their front line, they do a really poor job of getting pressure to the opposing back line. So when their opposing back line is hitting a long ball, they have time to take a touch, pick their head up, and then pick their pass. It's never hurried. And that's just bad. I mean, that is bad. When you're not getting pressure on the front line, from the front line, and you're not winning your duels from the back line, it spells disaster defensively. No. I'll buy that. Yeah, I'll buy that. And and one leads to the other, Doyle. Uh, if you're not getting pressure on the ball, you know how easy it, let me not say it, it's easy, but it just allows players to be able to pick passes in a way that can disrupt your back line. So it's not that one that the two situation scenarios are working in isolation. One is an effect is a reaction to the opposite one. I do think that if you're not getting pressure to the ball defensively, you should be able to be a little bit more organized, drop your line a little bit deeper and contest to win some of these duels. Uh, but I am buying this, Doyle. 
I'm selling this, guys. I, I don't think you guys are being harsh enough on this back line. <laughs> You're trying to pass along responsibility to the players in front, which I could understand if maybe Shakiri was playing against Atlanta United. Mm. But he was on the bench, and this team still struggled. This is really about the center back position for me. I think it's the weakest. Maybe in MLS, they've given up the most goals in the league. Uh, their underlying numbers, XG, is the highest in MLS. Chihos is the guy that's supposed to be the one that's supposed to be figuring things out. He's the one who's created more problems than anything. And in fact, by being overly aggressive at times, jumping into the lanes and not being responsible, Tehran gets the red card. He's out. Salquist, when he's played, giving up penalties, asleep, not uh, alert to plays where Montreal was able to get behind him. So I think the center back position is a massive problem from Frank Klopas and has put them in a really tough position. I don't see any answers, but I'm not passing responsibility to the midfield or the front line. Kalen Kal- 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 blaming the center backs. It's never the forwards fault. Forwards yeah. can't do anything. Yeah. It's always the center backs. Like and I'm it. sorry. If, I the for, if the forwards do their job, the center backs <laughs> job is easier, Kalen. <laughs> <laughs> I should have teed this up by calling it the Kalen Carr Derby. <laughs> My apologies. Chicago Thank taking you. on Houston. Respect. Yes. Yeah, yes. disrespectful. Wear that lighting. helmet. The winner gets a helmet. Yes. <laughs> or a headband. That's why you got your jacket on today, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> My apologies. Houston, Doyle. Yeah, our number is 268.4. That's the number of short passes the Dynamo complete per game, which is second in MLS, right on the Columbus Crew's heels. Uh, and they complete 92% of 92.1% of those short passes, which is the best mark in the league, even better than Columbus. I thought it was going to fall apart without Hector Herrera. I thought he was the straw that stirred the drink in every conceivable way last year. The fact that even without him, Houston have been able to keep their identity, get some minutes from good young players, maybe develop them a little bit, and be tough to beat. Ben Olsen, if there was a Coach of the Year vote right now, it is Ben Olsen for me in a landslide. You buying that? I was I was ready to buy it until the Ben Olsen for <laughs> Coach of the Year line. Are you buying that? A, that felt a little uh, jump in the gun here. I think Wilfred Nancy, who didn't win Coach of the Year last year, that was uh, given to Pat Noonan. So are you right? buying now that the Dynamo so. are a solid side oh, without absolutely. Hector Herrera? Absolutely. I, they've uh, they've uh, wildly ex- uh, exceeded my expectations and kept the game model, which for me is the most impressive. So absolutely, I'll buy that. Mo. Well. I'm buying it, and I don't even know why you asked Kalen if he was buying it. Of course he's going to buy it. It's <laughs> like, let's be realistic about life. But I'm buying it because I, 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 I like that Ben Olsen has a system that where even if you're missing one of your key components, you can still plug in players who understand the dynamics and the expectations from their roles and still have success. So that's the biggest thing for me. I'm not on the Ben Olsen for uh, Coach of the Year bandwagon just yet. But um, other than that, I'm buying it. If you're naming a Coach of the Year, though, who is it right now, Mo? Wilfred Nancy. Wilfred Nancy. <laughs> Minnesota, he's consistent. He's consistent. He Minnesota taking on Real Salt Lake. I'm not arguing with either one of them. Uh, Minnesota, who you got, Doyle? Uh, our number is .16. That's the non-penalty expected goals per shot that Minnesota are allowing so far this year, which is actually the worst mark in the league. That surprised me because I thought they were pretty good the first couple of weeks. They've really fallen off the last couple of weeks. They've been a little bit gappy and disorganized. And in particular, I focused on the amount of space between their back line and their central midfield. As they try to evolve into a pressing team, keeping those lines tight is going to be the key. And they really have not done it the past couple of weeks. They're going to need to hit the video room a couple of times under Eric Ramsey in the coming weeks, I think. No. <sighs> I'm going to keep my money in my pocket only because I feel like those things that you're discussing there are, are things that are easier to, to fix, right? Closing the gap between lanes is about just communicating. It's about being organi- organized a little bit more and about players taking ownership, right? Minnesota had a hot start to the season. Okay. A couple results haven't been positive in the way that they maybe had expected, but I feel like these are areas that are easier to correct and aren't like gla- uh, glaring and gaping issues that are going to have a longer term effect. Yeah, I'm going to sell this too. And and I think for some context, uh, Mickey Tapios was out. They played Pat Elford in center back position, not his natural position. I've seen enough from this side so far with the press to be encouraged in the way that Ramsey's going to implement it. Longwane not able to go from the start. Reynoso still di- dealing with his issues. Mm-hmm. So I think that gappiness is more of a function of missing some players, trying to integrate some players and I expect them to fix it. RSL. 
RSL, uh, our number for RSL is 4.17, which is the number of times per 90. They're switching the field of play, which is 10th in the league. So they're still almost in the top third of the league. Last year, they led the league by, uh, by a mile at 6.94 switches of play per 90. Uh, part of this is Pablo Ruiz being hurt. He's one of the maybe the very best in the league at switching play, that left foot of his. So why not use that as a weapon? But part of it also, I think, is that Pablo Mastroianni has changed his game model a little bit. They went into this season, you know, kind of ditching the 4-4-2. He's brought it back in, in parts here and there, but mostly playing a 4-2-3-1, the idea to get more skilled midfielders on the ball in central midfield, hit more short passes, keep the ball on the ground, control the game both in terms of where on the field it's played and the pace it's played at, use the switches more selectively. I think this play, paints a pretty accurate picture of how RSL's game model has changed in 2024. Yeah, I'm buying that. And I'm, get, I'm buying Pablo Mascherini changing the game model, understanding that they don't have Pablo Ruiz and we have to shift our tactics the way we set up our team. Chicho Arango at times dropping a little bit deeper underneath. And the big surprising stat to me was – Possession one in the final third, Real Salt Lake is number one in MLS right now doing that. So if you're winning the ball higher up the pitch and then you're able to get Chicho Arango involved more in the box, that equals success to me. So those long switches may be missing without their player, but I like the adaptation from uh, Real Salt Lake. I am buying, spending some money on RSL <laughs> because I also, yeah, I also like the evolution of Pablo Astromani, Mastroni, excuse me. I felt like it's a, a necessity, right? You can't just be stagnant and play the same system all the time, especially if it's not getting you to the ultimate level and, and, and reaching the highest heights that you want to achieve as a team. They have players now whose strengths lend themselves to playing a little bit more intricate, having a little bit more freedom to go and find the gaps. They'll still switch the point of attack to open up the game when Andres Gomez is on the pitch on one wing or if Fidel Barajas is on the opposite wing. But I think having a little bit more flexibility and adaptation in terms of their game model is going to suit RSL throughout the course of the season. Last one, Seattle Sounders taking on Montreal. The nightcap on Saturday night. Doyle, start us off with the Sounders. Yeah, I think I'm going to cost you guys some more money with this one. Uh, it's 0 0.07 is our number. That is Seattle's non-penalty expected goals per shot, which is the second lowest mark in the league. And I think it confirms what we've all seen is that with Albert Rusnak hurt and Pedro De La Vega mostly hurt and the 4-4-2 struggling and Jao Paulo still not having played yet this year, this team has not been good at creating chances. Everything that they're getting is like a half half chance or, or a, a snatched chance from knockdown, something like that. No clear-cut patterns of play that lead to high-level, repeatable chances, and it's obviously taken a toll on their forwards. Well, ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, I'm, I'm buying. I'm buying. Uh, it's it's a weird one because in the game against Galaxy, the last game I did for uh, was against was Seattle versus LA Galaxy, and they actually had a couple chances, right? But when you don't take those chances, when you if you're Raul Reed is and you don't finish off a chance, it's easy for the confidence of a group to start to drift off and, and fall a little bit. I think when they started playing with a little bit of urgency towards the back end of the of the second half, when they were really chasing the game, is when you saw them start to play a little bit more direct, start getting Jordan Morris into more attacking areas on the pitch. But I agree, it still doesn't look like the Seattle team that we're so used to seeing who can create chances, who attack space, who exploit the width and get service into the box. I'm going to I'm going to sell this one. Uh, it's hard to argue with the numbers, but I just can't help but still believe in Seattle and they're going to figure this out. If you give those same chances to Rui Diaz or that late chance Mo that uh, Jordan Morris had, I would bank back on them to get on the end of it and to finish it. So I'm holding strong on this Seattle uh, take, but it's been a tough start to the season to do it. They need Albert Ruzdak to start looking like a DP number 10. The good news is he's fit and he'll probably start in this game. Lastly, their opponent, Montreal. Yeah, 5.8. That's the number of shots on target per 90 Montreal are allowing so far this year, which is actually the third most in the league. Uh, the long road trip, I think, has caught up to them in a big way. I think they have done a really good job of managing expectations and managing games but they're not very good at defending in their keeper's lap. And that has been what they've been reduced to the past couple of weeks. And so I think what we'll need to see, maybe starting this week, but soon, at very, and like within the next couple of weeks at the latest, is some of that more expansive play that we expected from manager Laurent Courtois, who is part of the Wilfred Nance coaching tree. And when he was the coach at Columbus Crew 2 in MLS Next Pro, they were even 
more ball dominant at that level than the actual crew were in MLS. So it needs to happen sometime in the next couple of weeks for uh, for Montreal because as we learned way back at the start of this segment, being good with the ball is a great defensive tactic as well. I asked Courtois if they had already hit their goal of points on the road, and he told me it was too arrogant. <laughs> to <assume laughs> I felt very American at the time. I was like, okay, uh, but you, yeah, but they have. I'll, I'll see. Like, what they, the points they have already have been very good to begin with, and I think the tactics are going to change when they get home on April 20th in Montreal. I think we're going to see a completely different uh, team through Courtois. The way you described that he wants to play with the ball, um, but I, I think you know, Sirois has been very good at times. They had a freak, you know, that I called that freak goal from Chicago. They've been unlucky in moments as well. But I think you're going to see more of his tactics as they return back home. But I think for now, they still have to go with the same formula on the road. What do so you think, Mo? Did you buy or sell? Good That's question. That's a good question. I, <laughs> thank you, Mo, for I'm buying Montreal. On that. I'm buying Montreal. What do you got, Mo? Okay, okay. Um, I, so it's funny because I just said that I was buying the take on Seattle. Yes. But I'm going to sell this take because I think that Seattle gets a win at home against Montreal. At some point, things will start to change for Seattle. And I think this is more so a reflection of their play as it is to Montreal. Starting the, the first, what, six games on the road is a difficult task for any manager. And at, at a certain point, you start to crave to play in front of your home fans. Um, I agree with Kalen in that the tactics will start to change and look more like an identity once they start playing at home. But on the road against Seattle, it's a struggle. I think it will still be a struggle. Lumen Shield, always right a difficult place to play. 10.30 p.m. Eastern time right here on the MLS Season Pass. Before we go today, we are going to turn back the hands of time. Not, for, not so far for me, a little farther for some of you. <laughs> We are going to pretend we are Whoa. 25 Taylor, years Taylor, old. Taylor, that's a shot at you, bro. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it is. It Maybe. gotta be. Oh. It was more of a compliment at myself. It was a short bite. I'm 11. Just... It was a short bite. It's okay. You're right. You are 11. <laughs> you are 11. <laughs> It's just to make myself feel good. We are going to pretend we are 25 years old, and I want to know what club is a 25-year-old Taylor Twelman, Moadu. We'll start with you, Bradley Wright Phillips, oh, going me? to choose to play for all things considered. Oh, this Coach, is so easy. City, <laughs> chance Mo, this to is win, so easy. teammates, where are you going to play? You know, I, I could go bias here and say Red Bull. We've seen how that worked out. That was pretty good. You, you know decent. I can score goals there, Mo. You've seen it. I, went, I, I, I don't want to see that again. I've done a little digging and I, no, I was I looking at who again. creates the most chances. Who's got the most XG? Where would I do well? You and looked I saw, up XG for this? I, and I never do that. <laughs> and then I saw in Miami, they create a lot of chances. I can't see Tata dropping Luis Suarez for me, okay. even with the bad knee. Then it, I, I stumbled down the list a little more. I saw DC, not my style, plus they're the ops. The style, the service is more for <laughs> Ben Teke. And then I fell to LA Galaxy with the two wingers how much they want to create, get forward, crosses into the box, and then Ricky Pooja in the 10, a young Bradley Wright fit, 25-year-old Bradley Wright fit, with hair, the quick Bradley, dangerous. I'm dangerous in that team. Jovalich, Yeah, you're also, hold on, Mo, 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 he's dangerous in Hollywood too, by the way, if you catch my drift. <laughs> Bro, I'm not that's true. 25-year-old Bradley that's true. <laughs> Yeah, but I think LA Galaxy, that will suit me. That, that's that's uh, interesting, he can see that it. you played for LAFC. Exactly. You would go, you you're would trying go to get me straight across to, town to my LA Galaxy fan. I mean, my LAFC fans. I said Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> to my LAFC All fans. Those Galaxy I love you. Got. I love you. This is purely for. Goals. Oh, he's jumping ship right. already. Goals. This is purely. Oh, this is where yeah. Bradley Wright Phillips will yes. get goals at 25. This is professional, not personal. Mo. This is this is purely where I have no problem taking off the home kid and putting on the enemy as a kid. That's it. whatever. Whatever works for you, Brad. I, I see you. Whatever works for you. <laughs> All right. 25 year old Mo. All right, so listen, the the I know the cities. All right, go ahead. Uh, the, the family man <laughs> of oh me my initially, God, right I mean, initially, 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 I was like, you know what? Playing for either of the LA sides, it would make sense. My family could come watch me every game. I never got You're to enjoy 25, that in my career. You're so, 25, Mo. Yeah, that would have been dope. That would have yeah. been dope. Okay, okay. No, no, no. I mean, I mean my immediate family, not my oh, family okay. here. But yeah, that's the. I, I thought about LA. I was like, mm, no. And then I thought about, okay, growing as a player, who would like really move the needle for me and help me to progress and become the best version of myself? Will Fernandes is my favorite coach in the league. And I thought, you know what? Playing for the crew and this version of the crew, that'd be something. I don't want to live in Columbus. <laughs>
And, and then the obvious answer was just staring me in the face. Like, Mo, what are you doing? Why are you wasting time looking other places? South Beach. It's Miami. Oh, there we go. It's, you don't get any of that team. It's, 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 the, it's the, I have a chance to play alongside the best player this sport has ever produced. I have a chance to play against probably one of the top three or four in his position in Sergio Busquets. One of the best finishers this game has ever seen in the number nine in Luis Suarez. I was just going to say, you, you'll be, be playing center back. back. You'll be playing center back. There's no way you get in that midfield. Play, play, me, where, play me where you want. He played goalie, I think, to play. Play me where you want. Play alongside a GOAT. <laughs> I'm playing alongside a GOAT, and I will play in that midfield. I'll never bet against myself. So that's I where love it. that. South Beach, baby, let's go. Let's go. First off, you're playing right wing back for Tata Martino for 25 <laughs> to 30 minutes, and then you're coming out. Secondly, most importantly, the, the two of you, I am so disappointed in you. The love affair you guys have with Wilfred Nancy, <laughs> and neither one of you take him? What? No. I just What's said, I said baby. Sellouts for not Los enough. Angeles and Miami. Not enough. Not enough. You two are so predictable. Well, Taylor, first please well, surprise me. Like, Julian, Bradley Wright Phillips played for LAFC, and he just said on this program, I'm the aware. LA Galaxy. Have you seen? Go check oh. the numbers. Yeah, Go check the out. numbers, man. Go check where, the, where those chances it's are falling. That's Bradley Wright Phillips' numbers. areas, check territory. I know where you're going to play. You're going to go DC. They just cross the ball, and you can get your head on it <laughs> and head the ball all day. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be DC for you, Taylor. <laughs> First off, 0, 0.0 chance. You've hung out with me for a solid two years now. You know damn well I'm not playing in anything. Um, the heart tells me St. Louis City. Just to do that would be amazing. The brain tells me FC Cincinnati. And there's only one reason why. I went to grade school with Pat Noonan. I would love Pat Noonan to look at this face and tell me I played like absolute crap, <laughs> that I need to do this, that I need to do that. I would just love for Pat Noonan and Chris Albright to look at me and go, you know what? You're not good enough. You're just not good enough. We need you to do nah, this more. Nah, you, we need you to do that. And then for me, quite honestly, to look at Lucha and Costa and go, clean it up. <laughs> clean it up. You wouldn't tell him nothing. You see what he, he wouldn't tell him nothing. You hey, accept you he everything he says. It's reverse psychology what he's doing there. He's going to play with Pat Noon and Chris Albright because he knows he's never coming out the game. That's what that is right there. He's going to go play smart. with his friends, yeah. I respect the <laughs> yeah. yeah, I respect We're, we're challenging yourself. Oh, by the way, Mo. By the way, Mo, it's a solid 5% on the side. I take care of golf. I take care of everything. <laughs> Give me a new deal, yeah. and I, I take it you on the back end. I hear but it. for me not to say St. Louis City, I'm disingenuous. 1,000%. I'm going back to St. Louis. Mo, who is scoring more goals? Is it a Taylor Twelman on current FC Cincinnati, or is it Bradley Wright Phillips on the other galaxy? Mo, the uh, numbers I mean, don't lie. This, oh. this is this is, yeah, this is this is Brad in in LA. Just because, I mean, the amount of service he's gonna get, the amount of tap-ins he's Bad. gonna get. Cincinnati, that's where they're struggling right now. Is they in the in the attacking phase. That'll be my celebration each week. Yeah, they are yeah, because Bupenza hits everything twenty yards over the top, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow. What, wait, wait, wait. But one thing I will say, though, you, you took you guys came at me for not saying Wilfred Nancy. <laughs> but the, you didn't you missed. There was one point I left out. I'm going to Miami to play with those players. But in the next window. Yeah, Miami that's why you're going to Miami. Hey, and they're bringing in yeah, Wilfred Nancy. That's why you're going to Miami. <laughs> I you're going to Miami to, here, baby, for here. Your la to be launched to the Columbus Crew. You want me to believe that? No. Yeah, okay, Mom. No, 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 no. Wilfred Nancy's coming to Miami. Oh, you're bringing oh. him to Miami. Okay, now yeah, we're getting yeah, now we're getting carried yeah. away. This sounds like a conversation After for he goes week. to Southampton and then comes back. He'll go to Southampton Ooh. and Ooh. then You come. know what? This league with 25-year-old you guys, I want to cover this league, be too. carnage. Yeah. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. This league would fold in two seconds if 25-year-old Taylor Twelman was playing in this league right now. It's good that I'm not. <laughs> All right, well, we'll leave it there. We got all three of you guys coming this weekend covering everything on the MLS season pass. We'll see you next week.